you can fix a problem, but not, but, but not actually solve the hurt. So people carry the hurt, even though you've solved the problem and you move on, that same hurt will show up down the road and you'll wonder, well, what are you worried about? I thought we solved that problem. So for so what every answer to every problem is usually three or four questions back. Thank you for joining me on the Wealth Builders podcast. Well, in the previous podcast, you said I want to have David Briggs back. Well, here he is. He's staying for another one. And I'm telling you, the conversation that we've been having is so special. So, David, thanks for staying on oh, and doing I'm a glad part to do that. with Like me. a bad penny, I'll keep showing up. <laughs> I told you, those one-liners get your notepad out and your pen. Uh, David, you're just such a wealth of wisdom. And we started actually just visiting about something. We didn't have the cameras on. And we decided we've really got to film this. And it started uh, kind of with purpose and the pathway, but I'm gonna back up our conversation and I'm gonna start with my initial question, which was about when you map out things going into an organization, how do you approach that and how do you take those functions? And then from that point, listing out those activities, uh, just take us into that process and then let's visit a little bit about how you really get people in the right place in an organization. So first question, if you're to uh, do consulting with me and I'm working on an organization, which you are going to help me, which is great. How do I begin laying things out? The, the first thing I, I try to tell people is a lot of people that are really good at what they, you know, they do and everything. They don't really understand their enterprise, their organization. When I say the enterprise, I mean, when you look at the enterprise, what are all the things that you do? What are the functions? So uh, we were talking about, uh, the, so the first thing is I, they'll, I, they'll show me their departmental org chart, which I think is great. But usually in that departmental org chart, they have, they have uh, someone's name. They build it around people, but people come and go. And then they'll have titles, but their titles really don't have, they're not functional titles. They're just, you know, they give them some title to feel good about themselves or whatever. <laughs> I, but anyway, so what I, what I do, so look, let's, let's build out an enterprise org chart. What I mean about that is, do you really understand your enterprise, all the things that you do? Because if you don't, you don't know if you're, what you should do, shouldn't do, where it fits and all of that. So. Mm -hmm. The first, so what I'll what I'll do is I'll t I'll have them map out their uh, by function no names no direct reports no titles mm -hmm. and and so I say what are your major functions you know just I don't care if there's four or four hundred it doesn't matter how many they are but if you're going to put them up in in boxes so to speak what would you know what you know like legal finance, volunteer, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, would, I would say, you know, I'd say, okay, now what, what are all the functions that you do? What do you, what do you do? You know? And uh, so that, that would be everything from, I don't care if you sharpen pencils, sharpen scissors, change the toilet paper out in the bathroom, uh, signing major contracts. In other words, any kind of functionality that you yeah. do. Well, this is this part of it is new with me. You know, look, there's nothing new under the sun, you know. But <laughs> but if you were if you were going to move, like we talked about, you're going to move from a uh, you have a three bedroom home, mm -hmm. and you're going to move from that three bedroom home to another place. How, you know, you acquire a lot of junk over the years. You know, that's uh, right. And, and so so what what do you do? You go into there are certain things in your house that uh, affect every room of your house, like electricity. You know, you have a light switch and a plug in in almost every room, including the closet, because it's something that overarches over everything in your home that you need. There's other functions in your house that are limited to certain rooms, like water, for example. You know, you, you, you have, your kitchen has water pipe to it, your bathrooms do, but you don't have water pipe to every room of your house. So those are more specific to the function of that room. So, so if you're going to move that house, what would you do? 
you would take, you would take and you would load up, like you go to the kitchen, you're going to load up all your dishes, your silverware. So you're going to make a list of everything in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. You're going to put it in a box and you're going to label your box kitchen. So then you're going to go to your bedroom and you're, and so what, so what you do when you're building your, your org chart, or instead of that, you're putting up blocks of work side by side, major blocks of work. And then like to take finance, for example, you, you finance, there's a lot of things you do, but then it's going to, it's going to pool together in a grouping. Like you have bookkeeping and you have, mm -hmm. so those become boxes underneath those boxes. So that's the whole, in the whole finance box. Uh, so what you're doing is you're you're looking at your enterprise by function. So good. And then and then what it does it gives you a picture of the operational function of your enterprise. So so uh, I was telling you I was about the one person that I went to that they were in this organization. I had their administrators around, and I said uh, I said well you know what what do you do? And it was like crickets. <laughs> so one of the administrators came to their aid and they said. Well, they do a lot, you know, and they started listing what they do. And I'm listening. I said, that's great and wonderful. Then I turned to that same person. I said, what do you do? Again, it was crickets. Well, she knew this thing she did, but she couldn't identify them readily. I kind of caught her off guard. And that was my point. If you don't understand your enterprise and what you do, mm -hmm. then you don't really understand your, your organization, your business or whatever. So... We want to build out a picture. It's, it's like a one picture. Back, I was telling you, like back in the few days back before they got all the digital stuff, you'd walk into an auto parts store, and they would have this big, massive book, and there was this section sitting on there, and, and they had this big warehouse in the back. And so you come in saying, I have a 57 Chevy, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to get this part. And so you'd tell them the model of your car. They would go to that book, and they would flip it open, and they would first find, according to the chart, where that part was in their warehouse and their shelf. Then they go back and grab it and bring it to you. Mm -hmm. It's because that that is a picture of all their operational functions and, the, and it's all put together in places they can readily find it. It's a reference material. So you have your, so, so if you don't do, if you don't understand your enterprise, so you take that enterprise org chart mm -hmm. The reason you do that is you begin to find, well, you know what, this really would fit better over here. Or this would fit here, or maybe we merge these together. So you're getting a clear picture of your functions, so you're, you're, you're cleaning up your, your operations. Or you can say, you know what, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think about this. We, we, we have volunteers, for example. Yeah. Uh, and I don't even have a, a volunteer plan. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't, uh, we have a vertical that we're not doing anything in, so I need to add this. So maybe you're adding or subtracting or merging. Mm -hmm. and, and so what you do with that is that you take it and you, at the end of the day, you lay that enterprise org chart over your departmental org chart. And now people come and go, but you know every function that happens in all your departments and you clean it up because that's the picture of your operations, just like your business model map, you know, is a picture of your P&L. It's a one page look at your business. It's the way that you can look at it and know what's what's going on. And then, you know, you have your business plan. That is your methodology, your strategy of how you're going to get where you're going, uh, how you measure it, and how you're going to get money. But I tell people they usually build a business plan first. And the problem is, uh, you know, statistics don't lie, but people do. A lot of times what happens, you build your business plan first. That's a 35-page uh, justification for what you want to do that that's no reality. So they'll take that business plan and they throw it up on the refrigerator or collects dust on the file cabinet mm -hmm. because it's not a actionable item. That That is something that you're drawing people to vet what you do so they can give you money or whatever. Yeah. So the it's just like your job descriptions. It's your, it's your inter, you do enterprise job descriptions. So the whole, the whole reason behind that is that you really see your enterprise for what it is. Then you say, okay, like the electricity and water, what's the global policy? What policy affects the whole of the house? Yeah. What are in my verticals? Like we said in the kitchen, what in my, are, are a policy that, that is like the plumbing? There are certain things I do here that's specific to this vertical. And then my bedrooms. Now, here's the deal is, okay, how do, if I want to go come from my bedroom to my kitchen to get water, I have to have a glass because I want to take just a glass of water to the bedroom. 
that would be your SLAs. So you have your verticals, your service level agreements is where two verticals begin to interact with each other. You know, what's the wireframe? What's the process by which you do that? So that's like the door, that's like the doorway. If I come to your house and I knock on the door, it's your job to open the door to me. You tell me what I have to have to come in. I tell you what I want to do. So if you're in the AVL department of your organization or whatever, mm-hmm. I come and knock on the door and I say, hey, Karen, I want I, I want this video. You're, you have to tell me, well, here's the wireframe. I need this, 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 and this from you. I need these pictures, this, you know. And then you, I'm going to tell you, you can, you're going to get it scheduled. You're only going to get it in three weeks. I have to have it three weeks prior. So what you're doing is you're inviting me into your vertical, your world. Then once I give you and deliver that to you, I can have an expectation of you to deliver to me on time. So now the burden of work okay. is on you. So it's like having this massive highway. Sometimes in our organizations and our business, we have this massive highway but there's no exit and entrance ramps. <laughs> so that's what all SLAs are. So you're building out global policy, vertical policy and procedures, SOPs. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've gone to organizations where I had absolutely, great organizations but have actually absolutely no uh, SOPs. They have no standard operating procedures. So wow. they get stuck because they don't have a pathway or a map. Yeah. To regulate work. Or it's in someone's head. Right. So they have to keep going back to that one person. And What's my next step? And if that person leaves, you're in a world of hurt because now you have to do that stuff all over again. So uh, where you're great at working with you over there is, is that we, we can have benchmarks, milestones, all this, but I always, I'm always hearing you say to people, well, what are your next steps? Mm-hmm. So you take, so I, I tell people you go from strategy mm-hmm. to systems, systems or recipes. You make those so simple anybody can bake the cake, right? And then you go from you go from from the from the systems you go to operations. Do you have a do you have an operations manual that is a living document? They're living document because everything erodes over time. Right. You know, even skin and stuff. But the, the point is, is that is that you're is that you go from operations to tactics. And tactics is the methodology, the application, the action steps to make your operations work. And so those are the elements that that you go through because otherwise everybody's trying to be the boss. Everybody's trying to, you know, someone says, well, we have we have too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I said, no, that's not your problem. You have too many Indians to think they're chiefs. (laughs) So there's a difference, you know. So it's like we heard one guy say one time. You never leave your monkeys in charge of the bananas. You know, you got to know who's in charge of what, who's doing what, you know, and that's anyway. But so so you take that's the whole thing about understanding your enterprise. So now you're hiring to your enterprise. You're not hiring to fix problems. So you're not getting overstaffed. You're taking people's skill sets and you're measuring it to the enterprise. So you know where to put them. And the key to that is, is that and I can't remember if we talked about this before, but the key to that is. There's two things that happen in your organization. Attrition, every healthy body puts off waste. Now we're not calling people waste, but so but people come and go. And you have to have you have to have an exit door as well as an entry door. Mm -hmm. But then you have what we call reticulation. So attrition is how you move people out or they move themselves out. But a reticulation is you've seen the wine glasses where you have a bunch at the bottom and make a pyramid and you pour here and it Definitely. fills all the all the bottles. Well, reticulation is like that. It's just that when you're putting on pe- pressure on people to grow, mm-hmm. then what happens is you you might want to you might want to promote somebody, but sometimes you can promote good skilled people out of their skill set because they're they're reliable, integrous. Those are good character issues, but you know what? Just because you have a strong character doesn't mean you have a a, a skill. That's so good. And so. So when you promote people, you can't just promote them by character. You have to do it, but you promote them by skill. Like I told you earlier, I, so I can type. I hunt and peg. <laughs> but you, I can teach a monkey to type. That doesn't mean he's proficient. You know? <laughs> yeah. so, so when you're growing people, sometimes we, have, we hire out of our organization or we reposition people mm-hmm. 
because we trust them, they're loyal, whatever, but we actually reposition them out of their skill set. It's called the law, the law of diminishing returns is, is, is that that can happen in a lot of ways. So what happens instead of, so we get them doing something, but yet they don't touch their passion or their purpose. And so what happens is they atrophy. And so when they don't touch their passion, their purpose, they lose energy, they learn, lose focus, yes. they get tired, they get burnt out, all these things. And, but if we can reticulate them back into the organization at a level that they're skilled, so good. it's really a promotion, it's not a demotion. It's so good. And they're touching their passion, the person and their skills. Now they're energized because they're productive. It's something that they're good at. Mm -hmm. And so we're positioning them based on their passion, purpose, and skill set as opposed to just their loyalty or they've been around a while yeah. or we have a need, so we're just we filling it with somebody them. we trust. You know, and so that's learning how to attrition, how to handle attrition. Don't chase somebody down. And, and you know, it's like you're going to chase a lion. Fine, chase a lion, but what are you going to do when you catch it? You know, so you hold a dog by the ears, you can't hold on, and you can't afford to let him go because he'll bite you. So be careful what you're chasing after. That's you know, so you, you know, good. don't you don't you don't you attract things to where you want them to go. You don't chase them down. Do you know, David? I think um, I've worked with ministries. Uh, you've worked a lot with ministries. I think what you just described is so common that because in ministries, of course, character, integrity, trust those things and in other organizations too, especially like small organizations are important. But I actually, after you said that, it's like I have seen people that are just superstars and they get promoted and something happens. And I think you just totally like zeroed in on that. So how can we just be sure that we are not moving somebody because we trust them, you know, character without the skill set? Because in that case, we would lose a really, really good employee because we have moved them in the wrong place. What are some things we can do as leaders to make sure that we don't do that? And what are some things we can do to proactively put people into that place of passion and purpose? You know, there's a lot of tools where you can identify people, you know, test them out. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want somebody to answer phones and test them, I do a person personality, you know, there's all, you know, yeah. Myers-Briggs, there's all kinds of that. So I want to learn about the personality because here's what we have to understand is that behavior can be changed. Personality can't. But personality can be monitored and it can be measured, but it can't be changed. So I, I can take them through certain testings to discover their skills. Give, if they say they're good at bookkeeping, well, give, give them a, a doctored uh, balance sheet and see if they can read it. I mean, find out what their real skill set is. So find out what their skills are or what they have capacity to train to. Uh, and, you know, you can you can do that with uh, by the way you interview someone when you hire them. You know, res resumes are not a process of hiring. They're a process of elimination. Mm -hmm. You don't take resumes to hire people. You take resumes to eliminate people till you get to the one you can hire. So you're looking for things that are faulty that would cause them to be disqualified. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes approach resumes wrong. I'm, I'm always, so someone comes up and they say, well, I've had, you know, I've had, se I've worked in seven jobs. Well, if you've done that in seven years, we got a problem. <laughs> that means you can't, point. you can't stick around more than a year at any one place. So what causes you to be so nomadic? I'm not going to hire a nomad if I need somebody fixed to show up day by day. So those are the those are the things that I, so I can get a sense of who they are, but how do I? And then the other thing is, is is talk to them. Questions are some of the you know some of the best things that you can do because questions are locators. Mm -hmm. Questions never leave you neutral. If I ask you how to questions, not not why why is a bad question to ask anybody? Because it am is there's ambiguity in why? You ask them who, what, when, where, how. Those are the questions you want to get to. But so if I ask you a question, it never leaves you neutral. Whether you like it, can answer it, can't answer, whatever. When I walk away out of your presence, you still have to deal with that question because you can't walk away from yourself. Oh, David. So I can, I can measure your questions and locate you and let you locate yourself. Because even in correction and direction, if I ask you questions and just listen to you, 
then what takes place is I'm drawing out of you what's inside you will tell on yourself. And then also I can tell what you're passionate about. Because let's say that you, lo you love to exercise. I mean, that's your thing. Mm -hmm. If I'm f asking you about your hobbies, if I ask you a question that you're passionate about, you'll take off and start talking about it. So if I, if I can locate your passions because I can know how you respond to the questions I'm asking, I know what you don't care about, I know what you care about, I know what you're motivated about, what you're not motivated about. So questions are good locators. So good. And so that's one thing. I, I believe that you should always walk through, even when you're correcting somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a communication is more about listening than it is problem solving. Yeah. Can you give me an example? Um, and I, of course, no names or anything, but just like these are such great nuggets. Can you give us an, an example of how you use questions to locate something and then made a decision? Yeah. So let's say, for example, uh, conflict resolution, because that's a big thing for anybody. How do I, you yes. know, how do I herd cats? You know, you, you can't, you know, that's especially <laughs> if you have strong people. So every, every problem, especially in religious organizations, but <laughs> every problem usually is an authority problem at some level. And, and so, you know, the authority is found as its expression in three, three areas. Domestic authority, there is there is organizational authority, and there's civil authority. You know, and and so authority operates differently in different pockets. So, for example, conflict resolution. We have a tendency as as bosses to listen to solve problems. The problem with that is, you can fix a problem, but not, but but not actually solve the hurt. So people carry the hurt, even though you solve the problem and you move on, that same hurt will show up down the road and you'll wonder, well, what are you worried about? I thought we solved that problem. So for so what, every answer to every problem is usually three or four questions back. So it's not the first thing they say. It's like when people say, well, they say, or, you know, who are they, you know? So if you were to come to me and say, just for example, just tell me a problem. It doesn't matter. Any problem, just make up one. Um, my employee is coming to work late every day. So instead of listening to give you an answer, I would say what I want to say back to you is, now, Karen, what I, what I just heard you say was your employees are showing up late every day. Is that right? Did I hear you right? Yes. So you're going to either say yes or, or no. That I, if you say no, I'm going to say, well, tell me again. If you say yes, my next question will automatically be, how does that make you feel? Not that we're trying to solve feelings, but you do have feelings. The Bible says about Jesus, he's touched by our feelings, but he's moved by our faith. So he's not moved by feelings, but he's touched by them because you locate people that way. So I say, how does that make you feel? So this make up something. Just uh, how does that make you feel, Karen? Uh, makes me feel like I can't trust them to do to be there for the people that that are calling in or emailing or need help. So I hear you say it makes you feel like you can't trust those people for pe to manage people that are that are coming in and calling in that you can't trust them to to manage that and give them help. Mm -hmm. Is that I hear you right? Yes. So now, see again, I've gone to the second question. So now I'm going to the real layer of the issue that you're conflicted about is, is not the first thing that you said. I'm drilling down. Then I say, now, how does that make you feel? Makes me feel sad, like we're not following through with what we promise people that we would do for them. So see, if I'm getting two or three questions back, we went from the problem you stated that's not your real conflicted issue. The issue is you don't, you don't, you don't, you can't trust them. Mm -hmm. But personally, it's come, I'm feeling sad, or I'm feeling angry, or whatever that problem might be. Mm -hmm. Now we get to that. If I get to that, now I can deal with solving the problem. Why? Because you've had a fair hearing. You feel like. So if I was to ask you, do you feel like I've heard you right? So now you're open for me to bring correction, direction, 
or whatever because you feel like you've had a fair hearing. If I would have just solved the problem up front, we'll put in a, t- you know, put put in a, a punch in clock or so. I could have solved the issue, but never solved the problem, the hurt, the offense, or what was really troubling you. Wow, that is. So and then when I get good. there, I can ask, well, what do you think? What could we do to to solve this and to help it? that would help us going forward. Now I'm getting you to buy into helping me come to a solution. That is so good. And See? by the way, nobody's coming in late. <laughs> I just was like, I was, that I was taking notes. I know, I was like, who's coming in late? No, but that is amazing. And so it? when you get there now, then the next step is that is, all right, how can you help me in communication that if that starts happening again, how can you let me know without it getting to this point where you're having to have a meeting with me? Wow. So you might just, and so my wife and I do this all the time. She's got hand signals. She knows, I know when it's time to leave a place by the way she touches a certain part of my leg. It's time to go. Or I know if I'm talking too much, she'll, I, <laughs> I mean, so there's communication that where I cut to the chase real quickly so I can adjust. So you create those, that's the people skill of it is that, Every question, and if you notice, even what you said in the example, what does it appear like? It appears like an authority problem. And the reason is you're not knowing how to manage it. So you want to put, you want to put in disciplines and restrictions to change behavior. So if I, leave, if I read a job description in any organization, I read the job description, usually if they're extra long, I can tell you what they in I can tell you historically where they've had the biggest problems because the person that wrote the job description they're they're trying to find a way to reel people in to behave. Yes, they can add into the right. list, right? And the pe- the person that's reading the job description is trying to find the loopholes. That's what, you know, <laughs> what do I have to do? So now you're not creating a a a, a camaraderie or a covenant relationship whatever you want to call it. You're creating, because contracts are built on mistrust. Yeah. The only reason you have a contract is somebody's going to break it. And you want to hold somebody to the covenants in the contract. Yeah. And job descriptions, if they're not enterprise job descriptions, become that same type of contractual relationship. What can I demand of you? And the other one's saying, yes. what can I get away with? That's like W.C. Fields. He was reading the Bible, and someone came to him and said, well, you're atheist. What are you reading the Bible for? And he said, on, uh, and he said I'm looking for a loophole. You know, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what the people do. So those are, those are just some of the elements to answer you. That's a long way around answering that is, the question. That is awesome, though. You actually modeled, you know, what the, the question is. Like, you modeled very well what the difference is between just solving this problem out here and getting to the root of it. And what you keep your what you keep people away from, to me this is important, is how do you keep people from adding judgment to a fact? It's good. The Bible calls it a railing accusation. It said Michael, even when he came against the devil, did not bring a railing accusation or adding judgment to a fact. So so it's like trying to guide in somebody like a jumbo jet and you have two little flashlights. Don't think for a minute those flashlights are keeping that jet from hitting you. It's a matter of so what is what is adding judgment to a fact? That is, we use terminology like, well, I know what you're thinking. No, you don't. Doesn't matter how well you know somebody, you do not know what they're thinking. Or, you know, uh, I, I know why you did that. So we add judgments. So, for example, I tell my wife, mm-hmm. uh, I tell my wife, I'll be home at six o'clock this evening. Seven o'clock comes, eight o'clock comes, nine o'clock comes. I hadn't showed up. My wife, those are facts. I didn't call. I didn't show up on time. So the, my wife would go through the processes of, for example, well, he didn't show up at 6 o'clock because he's insensitive. That's a judgment. Yeah. He didn't show up at 7 o'clock because he doesn't care. He didn't, he didn't call at, at, not, at, at 8 o'clock because he just didn't have time to pay attention to me. All of those judgments came based on facts that were there. I didn't show up. I was late. I didn't call. There might have been other facts that would have changed that. I might have had a flat tire and I opened up my trunk and the spare was flat. My cell phone went dead. There could be a lot of other facts that if she would have known those facts would have changed the judgments or understanding. 
we have a tendency even at work with when we're when we're mitigating problems mm -hmm. is what we'll do is we don't listen to the whole all the facts and leading people to a place of resolve so what happens is they're adding judgments mm -hmm. and so they come in now with a chip on their shoulder and judgments that's why we're taking back where do you feel what do you feel mm -hmm is if you've placed judgments there, we got to move you away. Like we got a guy in the jumbo jet. Yeah. We've got to move you away from the railing accusation and get to the facts because true resolution, conf conflict resolution, no two parties walk away feeling completely satisfied with the, the decision. When someone comes out of the courtroom, two people come out, both of them don't love the judge. Only the one that won thinks the judge is great. That's why the Bible says, blessed be the peacemaker. I think the reason the peacemaker is blessed because they get the hound beat out of them. You know, when you're, when you're, yeah. when you're trying to resolve conflict or so in anything, not just conflict, but when you're managing and you don't communicate well to discover what's really going on, mm -hmm. then you're having to manage people's judgments and their feelings. And you waste a lot of energy trying to hurt in people instead of solve issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't remember if that was the original question. Anyway, we got here where we're at. <laughs> no, that is so good. And I, I mean, there's a lot there and I, I hope like I want to pack, you know, unpack this in another podcast for sure, because you're really giving people tools and insight that I've heard very few leaders have insight into. So David, this is amazing. With a few minutes that we have left, I'd like you to, um, share about how people respond like purpose or panic yeah because we're talking about people find their purpose yes the best example i know of quickly is i look in the bible of course yeah. you know I, I love the bible but uh but when you're trying to direct grow people run an organization you can't be threatened and all that because people that come under pressure if they have no sense of purpose it will always move them to panic because pe offended people are hard to direct. They're easily offended. People that have a sense of purpose, when pressure comes, it, it will move them to peace instead of panic. The best example I know about that is, is Paul in the book of Acts. Uh, he's, he's on a ship. He's a prisoner. He's in the bottom of the boat. I don't know how thick the deck is, but what separates the top from the bottom, maybe two feet or whatever. Yeah. They're in this hurricane. You, you've been to Florida. You know what hurricanes yes. are all about, storms. You know, here in Colorado, little drips. You know, <laughs> there it rains and frog stranglers, you know, big drops of water coming. <laughs> but so they're in this Rockledon or Eric Clyde in this storm. And Paul's the prisoner in the boat. The people up top, they, they don't have a sense of purpose and they're panicking because the pressure comes, the storm comes. So they're throwing stuff overboard. They're not measuring this as good. They're throwing all the lading and all the cargo. They're just trying to survive. They're panicking, have no direction, have no problem solving. They're just trying to survive. Paul's in the bottom of the boat. The angel appears to Paul, and a the angel doesn't talk to Paul about the storm. They're both in the same storm. The angel talks to Paul about his purpose. He says, Paul, you're going to do this. Don't worry about it. you got to go here. you got to go there. And so Paul's at peace because he's talking about it. So the storm, the pressure is moving him to a sense of clarity of purpose, not panic. Mm. So he's the prisoner. And all of a sudden, he comes to the top. The angel tells him, the last thing he tells him, he says, look, you got 276 people up here that have no purpose. They're panicking. But I'm going to take them because you're a person of purpose. You're going to anchor them and you're going to bring them to a safe haven you're going to secure them because of your purpose. And so what Paul did is the prisoner, all of a sudden the prisoner became the captain of the boat. So we call that, you know, favor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you get promotion, favor, and all that? Because when Paul comes to the top, he said, now guys, be of good cheer. You know, uh, take something to eat. Don't get worried. The angel of the Lord came to me and stood by me this night. And here's what he told me. So Paul anchored them according to the purpose that was there wow. and brought them to a safe haven. So in an organization, a business or whatever, you have, if you, if you as a leader have a strong sense of purpose, 
then what you do with your purpose, you anchor people into the vision or the mission of your organization where they find in that mission a sense of personal purpose and fulfillment, anchoring them where they fit, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And what you're doing, you're securing them and bringing them to a safe haven of fulfillment, of direction, of, of, of all that you're doing. Because as a person of purpose, if you teach them to have purpose and show them clearly where they fit in the organization or whatever, then when pressure comes and you're having to pivot, everything erodes over time, you're having a problem. You know, listen, problems happen every day. It's like people say, I'm going to save money. Uh, for case of a rainy day, but the problem is it rains every day, <laughs> you know, so savings is not a way to get rich. <laughs> you, know, that's, sure it, you know, that's just, so savings accounts different than investment account, right? Yes. So what you're doing is you're by a sense of, if you have a clear direction as a leader of purpose and you can anchor them into purpose and you can either attrition them or articulate them things we talked about, mm -hmm. you anchor them to bring them to a place of success. Well, that takes your business to a place of success. Mm -hmm. So the people part of it is, is you're teaching people how not to panic, how not to get offended, how to communicate, keep them away from all that junk. And what you're saying, we won't tolerate foolishness. We'll deal with foolishness. Now, we won't tolerate fools either. If you're a fool, we can't deal with you. But foolishness, we're going to keep you anchored to purpose, what matters. If you can be mature enough to locate your purpose in the mission of what you're doing and be anchored, then we can bring you to a safe haven, a place of success, a place of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And when the water in the bay rises, all the boats rise, you get the lead dog through, you get the whole pack through, you know, that's, yes. is that now you're, you're pushing those that are over you to a place of success and they're pulling you to a place of success. Wow. So good. Oh, so good. There's so much depth in everything that David has been sharing. I, you really need to do a book, David. Oh, for sure. <laughs> we were talking to him. Just like, I was like, David, you got to do a book. This is absolutely incredible. My goodness, you are full of wisdom, sir. Well, so I, what I want to tell you guys, you have to have not only people that consult, you know, that consult, but you got to have system experts like, Billy and like Karen and like some of these others that can say, okay, now what are your action steps? Because they're going to teach you how, what's applicable. How do you apply? True training is not teaching. There's an old joke that goes around those, those that uh, can't do teach, yes. you know, so there's a lot of information you can get there by theory, but you get in the game, like Billy says, yes. find all the hair and warts, problem solve, <laughs> see what's reality. Everybody cleans up good on Sunday. We all date well. It's the next day when you get married, that's where life begins. That's why I tell people, you don't need premarital counseling before you get married. You really need that counseling after you get married because so you're going to problem solve. Oh, you know what to, yeah. what to talk yeah, about. Yeah, talk right? about. So the, the, the training part, you teach what you know, you train what you do. And the word, the the in Proverbs it says, "Train up a child the way they should go." That word "train" in the Hebrew means create a desire. When babies were born in the, those days, and they wouldn't suckle, they'd rub olive oil on the roof of their mouth, and the baby would try to get the olive oil off, and it would train it to suckle so it could get nutriment. So we say, so training is the process of creating desire in people. So if I'm sitting here and I'm trying to teach my kid, <coughs> don't smoke, <laughs> it'll kill you. I'm teaching him not to smoke, but I'm training him to smoke. Oh, wow. So I'm teaching him what I know, but I'm training him by what I do. So an effective leader creates a desire in people, and, you, and that's where the people like Billy, like Karen, and mm -hmm. others can actually take you through the action steps, the applicable. That's why you do the coaching. It is. They get the, they get the teaching and the, the inspiration through the, the litany of information, the, the fire hose they're trying to, you, don't, you can't drink from fire hose, all you do is get wet. You don't believe that, go try to really drink from one, see, what, see how that works for you. It's taking that and applying it. Right, you take it and give, you put all that water in a glass, it's okay, here. You know, and so you're coaching them, that's why the coaching, signing up for coaching and all that, that's really the best thing you can do, because you hear all this information, if you really want it to translate into actual production, then those are the that's the money best spent because now you're being trained you're having outcome based education not just a 30,000 foot view of theory 
So good. Wow, David. Thank you so much. Isn't this been amazing? We'll have more of David on. Um, <laughs> that's like a, kind of a hope, but he'll do it. <laughs> Karen's my boss. I'll do what you Karen, Gabriella, they're all my boss. You know, that's I, you got to realize that. I just try to stay out of their way so things will work. <laughs> This has been amazing. I know that you have all enjoyed this so much. And I just want to take a moment again and just thank you so much for being a part of the Wealth Builders family. Thank you for tuning in. Please share this podcast with others that you know would be blessed by it. God bless you and make it a great rest of the day. Bye.